today's talk will be in six parts. We will sort of hit a couple of prerequisites for actually being able to play in tune. Then we'll mention a couple fun facts about the saxophone and the tuning. We'll explain the problems, why you're playing out of tune, and what you need to work on if you want to fix that. Then the next section is um, we will show you exercises on how to gain the flexibility in the embouchure that you need. And then we'll suggest a couple of things that you can do to improve your hearing. We don't think of intonation as a frequency or as an isolated thing. Rather, intonation is always a relationship between two notes. Every interval has a character and a special sound that is distinguishable from the others. And that's why we need to listen for those intervals when we want to play in tune. What do we need to play in tune? We obviously need a functioning saxophone. It's important to get checkups like every half year or so. Of course, we need support and good posture. And then one thing I am really adamant about is I always make tuning marks on my neck. I thought we'd just add in a little bit of some very sort of straightforward diagnostics just to lay these out and we'll elaborate on these as we go through. If you find that you're kind of chronically biting, one of the things you want to check is your mouthpiece. Thanks, Van Doren. With a mouthpiece, the two things, the way that the mouthpiece behaves, you've got the opening and you've got the facing length. They affect the resistance of the mouthpiece. And the classic thing very often is either a reed that's too hard for the tip opening and facing length, or a mouthpiece that's too open, or maybe has too short a facing, which makes it more resistant. And that leads to forcing, which then back on that chart, if we're trying to force a mouthpiece that's inappropriate, we're gonna fall into all of those pitfalls that we've got listed there. You know, there's a reason why people play on S90s and Concepts and, and Rasher mouthpieces and all these other mouthpieces that are within a general ballpark because they, they facilitate good playing. So if you know that you've done your practicing and you're just fighting your instrument, then it's the time to kind of look for some things that might make it a little bit easier or, you know, like to visit your repairman and just ask him if there's something wrong that can be fixed on your saxophone, such as leaks and stuff like that. Every time your saxophone goes out of adjustment, the key heights will change because the cork actually compresses over time. And that means that over time, the intonation of your saxophone changes. Saxophones have tuning tendencies. Technically, we want to play in such a way that brings all of that into as close of a sweet spot as we can find rather than maybe relying on alternative fingerings or so on. Generally, when we talk about that, we talk about equal temperament and just temperament. So when we want to tune, there are several steps. So if you cannot play every single pitch on your saxophone in equal temperament, meaning on perfect green on the tuner, then you need to work on that first. And that's how you play with a piano. However, when you want to play with saxophone or with strings, strings also play in just temperament. If you play the major third at 400 cents, it's actually going to sound wrong. That is a major third and equal temperament. And the next one is a major third and just temperament. And if you want to listen to those again, Wikipedia will show you these tonal excerpts. It's always tricky for me to say which one's more important, the beautiful tone or the intonation. And I would always argue that it's neither. I don't want to listen to anybody sounding awful and I don't want to listen to anybody sounding out of tune. It's the same with technique and rhythm and musicality, all those things kind of feed one another. When we practice, we just have to remember that we have to work on all of those aspects every single day. It's always striking to me how differently it rings in, in equal temperament and in just intonation. It's particularly important when we're tuning those chords in quartet. On a really practical level, if you're ever in that situation where your intonation just isn't locking in or your sound is not there, the best thing to do is just kind of forget about it and play more musically, even if it's not perfect. 
the more expressively we play, we can kind of just improve it just a little bit in work situations when I've had to kind of make something happen, that that's actually quite a good tip. And then I sort of went back on both saxophones and realized that it's just me playing the note flat. So yes, there are tuning tendencies and about every saxophone that you're gonna take in your hand, the middle D is gonna be sharp and the low D is gonna be flat. But most other things, we just have to start working on us first. And for that, we need a flexible embouchure that can adjust the pitch up or down. And then we need the hearing that can actually put the note where it needs to be. I also think I spent a lot of time trying to be too round I'm kind of going this way, but actually a bit of width, a kind of roundness here, and then a width here. But really, it's having the muscular support, which I feel here, and then with a good degree of flesh here, so that then we can really support the reed, and we can bring that flexibility in. It's dangerous to try and bring that flexibility and change your intonation in the glottal place with the tongue position. I found that that actually was quite sort of detrimental because it got in the way of all this these other good things that happen with good tongue position, i.e. articulation, vibrato, and so on. You know that you don't have enough flexibility if you can't bend pitches or if you can't play overtones. You should be able to bend like your palm key D for about a third without losing the pitch. You need to practice your pitch bends on all the notes on your saxophone. It's really in the same spot as that, the beginning of the half step bliss on the mouthpiece that we were talking about with with vibrato as well it kind of lives in the same physical space and the same physical kind of sensation that will not work if your reeds are too hard or you have too much pressure from your jaw um, because whatever the facing length of the, your mouthpiece is wrong for your face or you're not using enough air you also should practice overtones they are just several steps the first step is to get out the overtones but then you should actually work on getting them without moving your jaw the next step after that is learning to slur them so after you can slur the overtones which you can also not do with a tight neck um, i practice vibrato on them because that enforces the independence of the jaw and the voicing we also want to separate our tongue from the voicing and you can practice that with practicing rhythms on overtones. And then you make the rhythms more complex over time and see if you can hold the pitch. Then also one thing is to practice dynamics on overtones because a lot of us actually we pinch or we get tight when we wanna play soft and we open everything up when we wanna play loud. But if you do that on the overtones, the overtone will just drop out. So it's kind of a fun way of practicing because you immediately know when you're wrong. Wherever you are in your overtone practice, like have the next steps in mind and always move on because whatever you practice on those overtones, it helps you for your entire other saxophone technique. If you can do them on the overtones, then you're really in control. And so they're really, really great diagnostics. And practicing undertones is also a favorite of mine. The opposite of that is to play in the upper octave but not use your octave key. If you can do that, then you know that your voicing is in the right place and also that you have a fast enough airstream. Andy, do you practice mouthpiece pitch? I generally would aim to be able to play about an octave. A one octave C major scale is about right on an alto. It's important that you have the range. Yeah. Because then when you listen to other players and you listen to the piano and you have the range of flexibility, then you can match mm -hmm. any pitch. I'd like to come back to the topic of actually improving your hearing, which is the source of it all in the end. You just need the technique to be able to follow through with what you're hearing. We can sometimes learn to hear things wrong. I've got my little strategy, my, my scales and fourths and fifths and my tuning drones and slow scales. They, they kind of pull me into the right place, but I think finding strategies to make sure that you haven't learned to hear something in a place that doesn't quite isn't quite right. I think it's page nine. You go from note to note actually just pre-hearing every pitch and then moving your fingers. Another exercise is playing a melody and then you randomly stop and you sing the next pitch. I love the app Tonal Energy. If you go on the second, the round button, you get to this wheel and you can sustain pitches 
And then when you play, it, it will show you how, how sharp or flat you are. This is awesome if you are unsure whether or not you're playing perfectly in tune. You can also switch the tuning system. So you can switch it from just to equal temperament and kind of tune your thirds. You can also, and that's my even more favorite exercise that I use for playing altissimo. There's this little button here. It will play back the correct pitch. So you can play a run and I don't know, end up at an altissimo D and then the tuner will play how the D is correct. And it will kind of train your brain because over time you learn to pre-hear the actual pitch that it needs to be. On the side, you can record yourself and then you can slow it down. Then on the tuner, you can check how actually out of tune you were. And I know that this is all kind of crazy talk because in the end, who cares, right? It's supposed to sound good. But if we want to get into the nitty gritty details of saxophone playing and if we actually want to be really good, sometimes we need to look ourselves in the mirror and realize that our D is way too sharp. A very good, helpful thing is the tuning CD from Richard Schwartz. Um, he designed chords that you tune to. Um, and especially if you are in the early stages of working on intonation, they make it easier to hear. Uh, also plenty of drones online at some other websites and on YouTube. So no excuses. I do love the Londex books. They teach you to hear just intonation because they always work with drones and they kind of progress in an easy way. So if you want to get a head start on playing with drones and you need some inspiration, get those books. They are really, really, really helpful. The way I think about intonation comes from Ching Kwan Lin at the Eastman School of Music. It's a very, very easy thing to think about because he just thinks about the direction of the air. If you aim the air higher, the pitch will go up. If you aim the air lower, the pitch will go down. And that way, I don't have to think about what I do with my embouchure, what I do with my tongue, because that change will always do voicing first, which is my preference because um, voicing first changes the tone color the least. If I'm playing in the middle range and I'm going a little flat, um, actually, the it's the edges of the tongue for me, which I think means that I'm kind of not kind of working there wide enough, so I'm kind of collapsed in. Um, if you think about, I mean, I was taught to play, this is the kind of approach I was taught by Deborah Richmeyer, who is my kind of most recent teacher. She thinks nice, likes to think of the tongue as kind of spread. And if the edges of the tongue are not sort of sitting sort of out and over the bottom teeth a little bit, and this is at the front, it's not, I mean, the back where we're doing other things, then that can lead to the middle reg register to kind of go a little flat. And as I go high, I can salvage a lot of intonation and get myself in the right place by using the soft palate. And as I'm going up, I'm thinking to create space there. She would say, make sure you've, you've got a kind of ping pong ball in there. It means you can maintain your tongue position. My other problem spot is, you know, the very bottom. That'll get a little sharp if the back of my tongue, imagine this is your tongue, here is a little high. And so I just kind of just ease off that and sort of relaxation in the middle and the back of the tongue. Always with a goal inside that yeah. you have to be able to hear it. You have to be able to pre-hear it. Another way to check out if you're correct is actually if you put the tuner to the side and you kind of play and then you stop on the pitch and then you look over. Being in tune is a little like being in love. If you're unsure, you're probably not. One thing that I just want to mention in passing is tuning fingerings. I use it mainly for adjusting my thirds rather than tuning in general. I quickly want to mention last session, last month. It is important to practice your vibrato with drones. If it does get too wide, it will actually sound like you are out of tune. Or if you start the wave, start and end the wave, not on pitch, it will also sound like you're playing out of tune. On November 14th is our next at Mod Saxophone Talk, and we will be talking about all things altissimo.